Troy Morgan, President and CEO of Pantech Design. Um, I'm inviting you into my home uh, on a video so I can talk to you a little bit about Adapt Energy and how Adapt Energy works with a Sonnen battery, solar, and a full-blown home automation system. Um, I truly believe that this home is one of the most advanced homes when it comes to energy in the world. And I want to be able to share that with you. So uh, we're going to take some time and go through the solar, the battery, and adapt energy and how it all ties together. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the solar system that I have on the home. Uh, the system that we have put on uh, was designed by a company called Good Faith Solar. They're out of Richardson, Texas. Great company. I'd highly recommend them. Uh, they came and, and, and spent a lot of time with me discussing size of solar and, you know, how big we need to go and, and where things are going to be placed. And they helped us with permitting and a lot of the things that need to occur when you put a solar system on the home. Uh, this system here is a 12.16 kW system. Uh, it generates probably about uh, half of our needs during the uh, summertime and uh, twice as much as we need during the wintertime, really relative to our HVAC systems being in Texas. Um, now, there are a total of 38 solar panels, and each solar panel can generate upwards of 320 watts. They're LG320 uh, panels. There are 60 cells per panel, and one of the other things you'll notice about these panels is they're, they're all black. They don't really have a grid in them, so they're, they really use a whole lot, well, really all of the real estate they have on the panel to generate power. Uh, something else you'll notice is you're not gonna see any conduit or anything like that. And that's because this system has 19 microinverters. Now a microinverter's job is simply to take the DC power and turn it into AC so that it can send it to the home and the home can distribute it. Now this system with those 38 panels is broken up into four segments called arrays. Each one of these arrays can generate sort of its own power. Um, later on, we'll talk about how we control that. But we have a total of 12 panels on array number one, 12 panels on array number two, seven panels on array number three, and seven panels on array number four. And each one of the microinverters uh, has two of the panels connected to it. So my system generally uh, during the summertime is gonna produce about nine to 10,000 watts uh, during sort of the, the peak of the day. Um, and then as it starts cooling down, like right now it's in the 50s outside, uh, it's gonna be generating 11,000 plus. Uh, this is due to the efficiency of the panels. And when you have higher heat, you're gonna have a little less efficiency. However, these panels are probably the most efficient panels that you can get on the market. So this is my Sonen Ecolinks battery. I installed this battery in August of 2018, and uh, at the time that I installed the battery, I, I didn't actually have solar or really any adapt energy uh, stuff at that point, so no energy management, uh, just the battery itself. And I used this battery for quite a long period of time just as a battery backup. Provides resiliency just in case, you know, there's a grid loss. Uh, something else, though, that this battery does and why I was happy to have it um, is it, it has what, what I like to call the watchful eye on the grid. Uh, this is something that uh, is really great for your equipment in the home and you know things like CPUs that really don't like to see brownouts and, and situations like that. What the Sonnen battery does is it pays close attention to the grid at all times. And if it ever sees the grid sort of go out of spec where maybe the frequency shifts to where it's, it's out, of, out of spec or the voltage shifts to where it's out of spec, either too high or too low, it will automatically switch over to its own microgrid, basically battery power at that point. So it's kind of nice because uh, all this expensive equipment that you know we put in people's homes and that I have in my home is now protected because of the watchful eye of the Sonnen battery. Um, so I, I had it as a battery backup for uh, about mm, six months, something like that. And uh, around end of January is when I added solar. And once I added solar, it, it changed the mode of operation of the battery because the battery at that point is now uh, being used for self-consumption where I'm taking solar power and I'm storing it in the battery. And then I'm using the battery power later on at night when the sun is 
you know, not available. When it goes down, I actually go to backup power or battery power to power the loads in the home. Um, when I was using it just for battery backup, and actually even today as well, it, it can run the home for about uh, 10 to 12 hours. Now that doesn't mean it runs all the air conditioners and everything. It means that with Adapt Energy's help and managing loads in the home, I can run the essentials and some of the other things that I may want to have for comfort uh, for a good 10 to 12 hours. And I can do that because this battery happens to be a 20,000 watt or 20 kilowatt hour battery. So has quite a lot of power uh, to you know, last that long. Um, one of the other beautiful things about this battery is its battery chemistry. Sonin chose lithium iron phosphate for the chemistry of their batteries. And that's important to me because as you might notice, it's in my home. Uh, the fact that it's inside of my home means safety is a very, very important thing. So there, there are other battery manufacturers out there that make batteries that are using other chemistries. Um, one I'll sort of pick on a little bit is nickel magnesium cobalt or NMC. Uh, this battery chemistry is uh, something that when uh, they do puncture tests to, to sort of test how the battery chemistry is going to work um, in, a, in the event of a, you know, a puncture or something goes wrong with the battery, it actually uh, can burst into flames, it can burn underwater, and it generates somewhere between 700 and 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, it's quite scary, to be honest with you, when you start looking at battery chemistry that can do that. Burn underwater, that one really blew my mind. Now, the lithium iron phosphate batteries that, that Sonin uses, um, during a puncture test, they'll generate around 200 degrees Fahrenheit and simply bubble. That's that's all they do. So I feel pretty good about you know putting a battery like this inside of my home. Um, something else that's great about the Sonin battery is its warranty. They have the longest warranty on the market. It's a 15 year, 15,000 cycle warranty. When you start looking at cycles, this is the battery's ability to go from zero to 100 and back down to zero. Um, 15,000 of those, ooh, it's somewhere around 40 years of, of, of our lives, um, if it did it every, once a day. So their, their warranty being 15 year, 15,000 cycle is pretty amazing and something that, you know, I, I think if you're going to spend this kind of money and have this type of resiliency and capability, the warranty is obviously nice to have as well. I'm going to go ahead and open the battery up and you know take a look inside and we'll see a little bit more about what that looks like inside and I'll talk about some of the components. So simple key to open the battery. The battery has a base and then it's got this top part. Now down here are actually 10 2 kilowatt hour batteries. So that's where we get our 20 kilowatt hours from. And these, each one of these guys, like I said, they're lithium iron phosphate. Um, this gray box here is the inverter. This is what's gonna take uh, DC power from the solar. And actually, in my case, it's gonna be AC power from solar and converts it to DC into the batteries. And then goes the other way as well, takes the DC power from the batteries and converts it to AC so that we can feed the home with power. So this battery right here, something that in my opinion, everybody who has solar should have a battery like this. Um, one of the other neat things about what Sonin does is they allow you to start at a 12 kilowatt hour battery. So you don't have to go to a full 20 kilowatt hour like I do. Uh, you can start at 12, but they actually also have a battery uh, coming very soon that's a 30 kilowatt hour battery, which is really, really exciting. So it's gonna add an additional 10 kilowatt hour to uh, the overall size and capacity of the battery. So we're really excited to have this. We have used it in real live situations where we've lost grid power, and this guy has taken care of the home, made sure the equipment in the home's protected, and I have no doubt this thing's gonna last longer than I'll probably even live in this home. So excited about the Sonnen battery technology. What you're seeing here is completely retrofitted 
None of this was here when I purchased the home. Uh, this was all added after the fact. Um, and I want to walk you guys through all the technology that you're looking at and, and give you a, a real good sense of how all this kind of comes together and what it's all for. So this top left panel right here, this load center, is called a solar aggregation panel. This is actually where all of the solar power that the uh, panels that you saw generate uh, power and bring it into this one load center. And it's done, I mentioned earlier, the four array strings. Well, each one of these double pole breakers represents one of those array strings. And these are controllable breakers and connect to our adapt energy panel, which we'll talk about here in a moment. So you'll notice this wire here connected to this breaker has a little box on it. This is actually called a current transformer. This thing's job is to read the power that the solar is producing that's coming into the circuit breaker. And I have one on each one of the circuit breakers so that I can monitor each one of the solar array strings individually. So not only am I capable of monitoring, but I can also control as well. And you'll notice there's a little Molex connector here that uh, allows us to plug into the breaker. It's a real simple installation. This gives us control of each one of those solar arrays. Now, after those solar arrays are sort of bringing power in, they're gonna send that power back up this way. You'll notice these two gray boxes here. These gray boxes are also current transformers, and these are connected directly to the Sonnen battery. So that gives the Sonnen battery a total or aggregated total of production from each one of the four solar arrays. And the last piece here is this, this guy right here, he's a, a, called a PV meter, a photovoltaic meter. Basically, these current transformers plug into this meter and this meter is actually connected to the Sonnen battery. So, uh, normally you wouldn't have to do this, but because I did install my batteries somewhat far away from the solar aggregation load center, I went ahead and chose this method instead uh, and had to put this guy in. Now to the right is the adapt energy panel. When this ships, it ships all ready to go, completed and done. We, uh, it's actually got a black cover on it that says adapt energy. And you do have to bring a few wires of your own in, but very few. You're only going to need to bring in power. And from there, you're going to connect your relay control wires to however many relay control breakers uh, you're going to be controlling. I'm going to walk you through the components in this panel, but one thing I do want to call attention to about the panel in general and its design is it's a component level design. Now, there are a lot of other uh, companies out there that are making products that are what I consider to be board level designs. And these designs uh, are all integrated on one single circuit board. The relays and all the goodies, the power supplies and things, typically all built into one board. Um, this is not necessarily a, a good thing. And, and I, we certainly don't believe it is. And that's why we chose to do it this way. Um, the reason why we don't like a board level design is because if something were to happen to any one of the little pieces on the circuit board, maybe a relay or something goes bad, you actually have to replace the whole board. So you're actually pulling the panel out and putting a new panel in. And it could also render everything that you're controlling in terms of the loads, well, dead. Meaning your washer, your dryer, your HVAC systems, all, all of those things might be, well, dead. And so rather than go with a board level design, <clears throat> we chose a component level design to make sure that we don't put a customer in that position. Component level design allows us to, uh, number one, make sure that if something were to fail, the whole thing doesn't fail. And then number two, make it field uh, maintainable. And I'll, I'll walk you through how how we do a few of those things. So to start with, up at the top left here, you're gonna see this little gray device. This device is called a plug trap. 
Uh, it's kind of a weird name. Um, I'll rename it just for the sake of understanding. It is the Super Special Surge Protector. This guy right here can take a massive lightning strike or uh, an overvoltage situation. The beauty of this piece is it's self-sacrificing. Now you'll notice I just took this thing out and the panel stayed alive. The same thing would occur if this thing took a, a lightning strike. What's going to happen is it's going to sacrifice itself and it's going to blow internally. And after it's done blowing, it's no longer protected anymore, but the panel will stay alive. This is a really cool piece. It also, uh, you might have heard my phone make a little ding there. Well, it's because I just got a text message indicating that Adapt Energy has detected a problem with the surge protector. And that's because I removed this little guy. So I'm going to put this little guy back in. And after I put it in, we're going to be protected again. And everything's back to normal. Now to the right of that is a power supply. Real simple. It's going to take high voltage or 120 volts in and supply 24 volts DC out to power up all the devices in the panel, as well as uh, the control of the breakers themselves. Because we do supply power to those in order to open or energize a coil to open up the, the circuit. To the right of that are our hardwired grid loss detectors. These guys give us the ability to recognize that power has been cut off. Now, we choose a hardwired grid loss detection method because we, in some cases, need to be able to turn off breakers very, very quickly. Um, our system is capable of shutting off breakers within a half a second of recognizing that grid loss. And we also have two of these in here so that you are able to monitor both phase A and phase B. Some people may not need that type of speed. And if you don't, it is okay to use a software level grid loss detection method. Um, with Sonin, we do have that capability as well. However, we really like to do it hardwired because that's what's going to give us the ability to, to know as fast as possible that we've lost grid power. To the right of that is a thermal breaker. This thermal breaker is installed in, in the panel for one purpose, and that protects against any back feeding of power from any one of the controlled breakers. This will basically just trip if it ever recognizes a back feed of power. To the right of that is the UPS. We went ahead and put a UPS in the panel because we want this panel to survive, if you will, the 100 millisecond transfer of a Sonin battery, or maybe there's a, another transfer time that we're dealing with and we wanna make sure that this stays alive so it can do its job, especially during a grid loss. Um, this thing right here will last a good five to eight, eight minutes under normal conditions. Down here, some distribution. This is actually where we're bringing power and ground in and these wires go out to the uh, relay control breakers. To the right of that, these guys are the actual relay controllers for the breakers. These are single pole double throw relays that we use in reverse. It's a pretty genius design the way our engineers came up with, uh, with how to use this. And the beauty of these things is the magic is in this little white piece here. So if there's ever a problem with one of these guys, it's a simple replacement of a $15 part and I simply can put it back in and I'm back up and running. Really that white piece is the magic. The rest, the whole green thing here, just plastic. For the, mo for the most part, that's all that's there. So again, along the lines of that, that field maintainability and then component level design, this is a perfect example of one of the reasons why we chose to go with that method. To the right of that is a Crestron processor. Crestron processor for the brains of everything that, that you'll see in our software and also the control of all of the breakers. Now, a Crestron processor like this is probably one of the best processors you can buy for home automation. It's used in government installations, military installations because of its security. Crestron has the highest level of security capable on the market when it comes to uh, processors and, and, you know, Internet of Things type devices. That's one of the reasons why we chose this one. It's also 
uh, a nice form factor for, for the panel as well. So this guy holds all of the brains for Adapt Energy. These two boxes down here, you'll notice they've got some numbers, 92 and 93. These are the dry contact controllers for these single pole double throw relays. We simply close a contact here and it will close a contact there. So if I press this button, that light will light up and it basically just closed a contact to turn on a breaker. If I hit that button there, it turns off. Um, for the electricians out there, or the, or the guys actually doing the installation of, of an Adapt Energy panel, you'll love this because you won't have to whip out the phone or the iPad or really even deal with any software in order to test the uh, functionality of the system with respect to control of the breakers because you have that control right here. It makes it very, very nice. Last but not least, down at the bottom here, you'll see these, these four Ethernet wires. We actually have a switch. It's a little tough to see, but underneath this box here is an Ethernet switch. This Ethernet switch's purpose is to keep us in constant communication with the Sonnen battery. This also means that everything can fall apart around the Adapt Energy panel and the Sonnen battery, like the internet can completely go down, or the home network can go down and fail, or things like that. We don't have to worry about those things failing because we are in constant communication with the Sonnen battery because of this switch. You'll also want to connect, so you're going to connect your Sonnen battery to this switch, and then you'll connect this switch to the home network. This way your customer can obviously whip out their phone and control things and, and whatnot, but we don't have to rely at all on the home network or the internet for Adapt Energy, energy to do its job. Uh, below that is a monitoring system. This is a Crestron monitoring system. This gives me the ability to monitor up to 30 different loads in the home. I've had this monitoring system for quite a while, it's, and it's typically used in, in larger installations, uh, buildings, and things like that. Um, it's pretty amazing and highly accurate. Um, not the most inexpensive thing out there. Um, I think something like this all in is probably gonna be around 15 to $20,000. I have this because I've had this since 2013 and been monitoring energy since then. Um, but I, we chose not to integrate the Crestron monitoring solution with Adapt Energy. Uh, we actually chose to integrate Curb instead. So Curb is a company that makes a monitoring system that is highly capable, just like the Crestron system, very accurate and provides us with a lot of monitoring information and data. That software, or their software, and our software are integrated together now, and you can actually see uh, curb data within our dashboard. Um, the difference in price, pretty dramatic. $399 for a curb unit like this. Um, I actually chose to put two in, and I'm now capable of monitoring 36 different uh, loads in the home. And so I, I went ahead and sort of loaded it up to try to match as much of what I already have with the Crestron monitoring system. To the right of that is the load center. Now inside of this load center, it's all pretty standard stuff in terms of the breakers until you get to here. You'll notice that we have some, they're, they're a little larger and it's very similar to what we saw. So actually it's identical to what we have over here. These we are controlling. We are not controlling any of these. So when I lose grid power and we go on battery power, these guys are all going to be powered up. These may or may not be powered up depending on how we've configured the system and what these should do based on a grid loss. Now, I actually have a four ton and a three ton AC unit inside of this load center. And Normally, you wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, the Sonnen battery can handle up to 33.33 amps or 8,000 watts. Um, a four ton and a three ton AC unit, um, roughly going to be somewhere around 
70 amps, 75 amps, something like that when they're, when they're running. Um, so obviously the battery would not be able to power both of those at the same time. By putting controllable breakers on those heavy loads, I can choose in our configuration, our software, we can choose which one of those would be on and which one of those is going to be off. That's part of the purpose of Adapt Energy is to control load uh, to sort of set up the system properly. You'll also notice I have those CTs as well. These are the curb CTs. And then these donut things here are the Crestron CTs. So these guys are actually connected to this panel down here. And these guys are connected to our curb devices right here. So all of this again was done as a retrofit and didn't really take too terribly long. I, I think we, uh, we probably had this done in about a day and a half uh, all in. So not, not too terrible of, uh, of an installation. And the other thing I should mention is um, our Adapt Energy panel, I chose to put it in wall, but you can absolutely do it on wall as well and just bring conduit into the panel if, if that's an easier or maybe more logical installation for what you're trying to do. So that's the, the brains of energy automation in, in my home and all centered around Adapt Energy uh, from the standpoint of control and, and uh, monitoring and, and energy sort of management all around. So this is the Adapt Energy dashboard, um, and also going to show you a lot of Sonin information as well. Um, I want to walk you through what each one of these pieces of data is, and, and this is obviously live, so we'll start with the solar. Uh, you can see that my system is generating 6,000 plus watts right now of solar. It's a beautiful sunny day. Um, as you look down, you'll notice that my battery is 100% charged. Now that happened approximately 1.30 today. It is now 3.20 and my battery has been charged at 100%. So you'll notice there's no solar actually feeding into the battery because the battery is fully charged. However, what the solar is doing is powering the home's current consumption. Current consumption is floating between 1,700 to 2,000 watts. And then the rest is feeding the grid because my home is only using very little, actually, uh, power right now. No air conditioners are on. It's pretty much just lights and, and you know, some of the basics. Now, at the top left here, you'll see that we have the estimated time remaining. I have over 11 hours of time available on the battery. This means that if I were to lose power right now, my battery, based on its current state of charge being 100%, and the home's consumption being around 1800 watts is going to last about 11 hours. You'll notice it will fluctuate based on the consumption of the home. Now to the right here, you're going to see another number, 101%. This number right here indicates what my past 24 hour autonomy to the grid has been. This means that between 322 today and 322 yesterday, I have not used any grid power at all. I have been 100% off grid based on solar and battery storage. So the normal operation of my system is considered self-consumption. This basically, or daily cycling actually, can, can be said as well. This basically means that my system will take solar power, store the battery, actually power the, the loads in the home first, any excess solar power then charges the battery, and then any excess power after that will go to the grid. That will only happen after the battery gets to 100%. One last thing on this dashboard you'll notice is the backup reserve. My backup reserve I typically keep around 9%. This means at the end of the day when solar power goes away, my battery is going to discharge from 100% all the way down to 9% to power the loads in the home. It will typically uh, run until about 12 to 12.30 at night uh, until it gets down to that 9%. There are a few other settings that you can uh, see here about the battery. 
These are the different operating modes of the battery. I mentioned earlier that my battery, when it was first installed, uh, we used it as strictly backup, and that would be this mode here. I use it in self-consumption, which we talked about, and there's also time of use, which is something that if you have time of use rates, uh, works quite well when using the sun and battery. You don't even need solar to, to accomplish that. You'll see I can set my microgrid recheck times. These work for uh, when your system is sort of offline, if you will, for a long extended period of time. Maybe there's a hurricane or something like that and you've had you know, a power loss for three days. Well, the sun and battery's got an intelligent uh, piece to it where it will stay alive but in a very dormant state and it'll wake up at these recheck times to see if there's any power available, either from the grid or from solar. And if there is, it'll actually wake its full brain up and, and start doing what it's supposed to do. You can also, as you, see, as you can see here, connect a generator to the sun and battery and set the automatic start turn on point and turn off point. So this would indicate that when the generator or when the sun and battery gets to 8%, that's when we want to go ahead and kick the generator on. And when the sun and battery is charged to 94%, we would turn off the generator. The next thing I want to talk to you about is some basic information that the battery provides about a system and the grid and BMS. Real simple information, production, consumption, the capacity of the battery, we talked a little bit about how many modules I have. I've got 10 modules, each one being uh, 2 kilowatt hour. It gives me my 20 kilowatt hour. And then my inverter maximum. And you'll also notice the AC voltage and frequency and DC voltage of both the grid and the battery itself. To the right of that on the dashboard is our usage information. Now, because of our interconnection to curb, we are able to bring in all of this monitoring data. Up at the very top, you'll notice that I'm producing a little under 6,000 watts. The home's total consumption is about 4,300, and that means that I'm feeding the grid a little under 1,500 watts. I'm 100% off-grid, and my home is powered from solar. You'll also notice that we separate the production circuits from the consumption circuits. These are the CTs. Each one of these represents a CT that we talked about earlier. Now you'll notice also I have a lot more that I'm monitoring. A lot of things here that are off and a few things that are on. In this view I can see my top consuming at the top of the list and my top producing at the top of the list. I can also switch over to an alphabetical view if I'm trying to really pinpoint a load because obviously with this top-down approach these will shift and change. The next part of the dashboard is the breaker control piece. This is where I can actually turn on and off any one of those 16 relay controlled breakers. So you can see here that my hot water circulation pump is currently drawing 25 watts I see that data courtesy of Curb, and if I hit this and turn it off, that just shut down the breaker in the load center, and you can see that we're drawing zero watts. I'll go ahead and turn that back on, and it will start consuming power, and it'll work its way up to 25 to 30 watts, which is generally where it is. Now this is all fine and good. We love to be able to see information, control things, but this is about energy automation and the automation side of it is in our scheduler. This is where you're going to determine what you want to have happen at what time. So simply by opening up a new schedule I can give this a name, say test 3. I can choose to have a schedule run at an exact time or maybe at sunrise which in my case is 7.47 a.m., or at sunset, which is 6.37 p.m. I can even choose an offset to that, so I could say two hours after sunset. 
I can choose the days of the week. So maybe this schedule is only going to run Monday through Friday. I can also set my HVAC temperatures based on this schedule. So I'm going to say I'll set this to 70 degrees and 68. And you can see it changed because we have a dead band built in. We also now can set certain breakers to either turn on or off. And in this case, I'm just going to say, let's turn on hot water heaters one and two, and we'll turn off the EV charger and the pool pump. And last but not least, we can also set a backup reserve. So when this schedule runs, it's going to set my HVAC for me. It's going to change some breakers, turning some on and some off and it's going to set the backup reserve and it will also send me a text notification letting me know that Adapt Energy has run test 3 in the schedule. This allows you to manage the energy in the home and have this automated so that you don't have to touch it. And your list will show you all of your schedules and you can choose to see them all or you can see just the ones that are going to run today based on how you've set your schedules. In the setup area, this is where you're going to make adjustments to the text notification. So add phone numbers for whomever you would like to be notified of grid loss and weather events and, and things like your surge protector and schedules. You can also set up your own power profiles. So you can decide what happens when you press these buttons. In my case, I have one labeled turn most circuits on and most circuits, meaning that I'm going to turn off these three and, and everything else will, will stay the way it was. And these are totally configurable. Now there's a deeper level setup that you can go into. This is not typically something a homeowner would ever need to go deal with or do but I'll show it just so that you can see a little bit of the setup. Giving breaker information here, maybe a description of the breaker. In this case, the solar array can generate up to 3,840 watts. This is where I would adjust my curb monitoring and assign any one of these monitored loads or CTs to a controlled breaker. And this is where we determine what is going to happen during a power event. Now, these power events are things that are out of our control. So like a grid loss. When a grid loss occurs, I leave solar array one and two on, but I shut down three and four. I do this because I want to make sure that I stay just under that 8,000 watt inverter capacity in the sun and battery. I'm also going to leave my East AC condenser and furnace and fan on. However, you can see I've set a delay. This helps with the inrush of, of power so that when a grid loss occurs, the battery does not get hit with a whole bunch of load. We actually wait a little bit. And we also make sure to turn off the West furnace and fan and West AC condenser. We lock those controls as well so that you cannot turn them on because the battery itself cannot power both the east and west AC condensers. Now when the grid comes back, we do the obvious, at least what I would think would be obvious, we turn everything back on. Now when we detect severe weather, we do a few other things. We don't do much to the load because we haven't lost power yet. However, we do load balance the home. This means I want to shut down some things because I'm also going to tell the battery to charge up to 100%. Now I do this because my normal backup reserve in self-consumption or, or daily cycling is 9%. But if there's severe weather in the area and I have a higher probability of having a grid loss, I want that battery to be at 100%. So I now have my you know roughly 11 hours of capacity. The other thing the system's gonna do is pre-cool and preheat the home. This way, if I actually do have a power outage, my home is nice and comfortable, and I won't necessarily have to use battery power to power my air conditioners or my heaters. And last but not least, our weather alerts. As you can see, there are quite a few. 
You simply need to pick which alerts you want to be notified about. And if you've chosen to include an alert, you will be notified via text. And you can also set it to automatically protect the home. So if auto protect is selected, it is going to run that uh, severe weather sequence that we looked at just a moment ago, and it'll do that automatically. If it is not selected, you will still have the option. So now let's talk a little bit about the customer facing iPhone application. Now in the iPhone application, you're going to have a lot of information about what's going on with the battery and the power in the home. As you can see here, you can set your backup reserve. I have my backup reserve set to 9% because I use my, my system as, as a daily cycling system. You can see what your solar production is. You can see how much energy storage time you have available. That is relative to the battery's current state of charge and the home's current consumption. Now my battery being at 100% right now and the home consumption being under 2,000 watts, I'm going to be a little over 11 hours uh, of power available. So if I were to lose grid loss or have a grid loss right now, I'd, I'd, I'm going to be able to run for a good 11 plus hours. You can also see that I'm generating a little over 5,500 watts of solar and the home's only using a little under 1,800 watts. So the rest is actually being fed back to the grid. This number here is going to tell you exactly how much you've been autonomous to the grid in a 24 hour period. So between 341 today and 341 yesterday, I have been 101% autonomous to the grid. This means that I have not used any grid power between 341 yesterday and 341 today. You have one other thing that you can do. This is your breaker control page. This is where you have the ability to turn on or off breakers as you see fit in different situations. So if we take a look at this hot water circulation pump right here, and see it's drawing 25 watts, I'm going to go ahead and turn that off. Now that physically just shut off a breaker in my load center. And you'll also notice that it's drawing zero watts now. We'll go ahead and turn that back on. And as soon as we, uh, we start drawing power, you'll see that it will raise back up to whatever it was. Most of the time, you're not going to need to manage this because it's an automated system and it's going to handle all of this for you. However, you may be in a situation where you have a grid loss occur and the system has automatically shut off certain things like pool pumps and hot water heaters and you may want to go ahead and turn on a hot water heater so that you can take a hot shower. So right now we're going to do a little uh, weather event test. I'm going to show you guys exactly what happens to the end user uh, device. As you can see, we have a weather event that just occurred. And I have some options now. I can protect my home. I could ignore the alert that came in. I could always ignore the alert. You'll also notice I got a text as well. Adapt Energy is detected, in this case, a test alert. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say I want to protect my home. Now, based on that protection, you're going to notice a few things. It's probably going to get a little dark in here because we shut off some lights. Our shades are going to change. We also just got another text letting us know that Adapt Energy has protected the home. And you'll see also our backup reserve has been changed to 100%. And we've also shut down some of our breakers. And you'll also notice on the app, we have our test alert being active. Now I'm going to go ahead and lift the alert now, and this would obviously be automated. NOAA and NWS is who we're polling regularly. And when the alert is lifted, the home, as you see, will return back to normal. And that's just a small part of our weather event uh, testing. We also just got another text that says that all the weather alerts have been lifted. That's how Adapt Energy can integrate with a home automation system with shades and lights. Uh, but obviously everything that you saw here would be just the energy automation side of things. So I want to show you now what happens with Adapt Energy 
during a grid loss. So take a look here and you'll notice that the grid has just gone down. The battery has taken over. We've lowered our shade so that we can keep the ambient temperature down. Our music that was playing is going to shut off and our lighting eventually is going to change as well. Now, I just received a text letting me know that Adapt Energy has detected a power outage. And you see I've got some options here. I can choose to turn most circuits on, turn comfort circuits on, or turn essential circuits on only. Now in this case, I'm gonna say I don't know how long this is gonna last. So I'm really only gonna worry about my essentials only. So by pressing essentials only, you'll see that we've turned off quite a few breakers. Our lighting just went ahead and dimmed. And now we are okay to operate for almost 10 hours under current conditions. So as you can see by looking at my phone and looking at the iPad, we are still off grid. Um, the battery is still powering the home. However, we actually brought grid power back about four minutes ago. And the reason why we don't have power yet is because the Sonnen battery is doing a grid check. It's got to check the grid for, you know, good power, basically within spec power uh, coming into the home. And it's got to watch the grid for five minutes straight for perfect power. If at maybe two minutes and 30 seconds of it watching the grid, it sees a power blip or something like that, it's going to restart that timer. Um, we probably won't have that happen here. Uh, so in about you know 30 seconds or so, you'll hear, maybe hear, the automatic transfer switch fire in the sun and battery, and it will take us off of the microgrid and put us back on the grid. Just for the sake of looking at it, it just fired. The home is going to return back to normal, which means my shades are going to go up, my lights came back on, because I had music on earlier, my music will return. And you'll notice the breakers are also coming back to life. So we are now back to normal and back on grid power. And that's what you can do with Adapt Energy and a home automation system like Crestron or Control 4, because Adapt Energy does communicate with both of those. I also did just receive a text that power is being restored. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to watch uh, this video. Watch more about Adapt Energy and how Adapt Energy and Sonin Ecolinks and home automation and all can be tied together to have the most amazing experience possible. Um, I want to introduce Megan Corcoran. She's our VP of Business Development, and she's going to tell you a little bit about how you can get in touch with us. Absolutely. So you can reach out to me directly at adaptsales at pantechdesign.com or check out our website, www.pantechdesign.com. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram for all the latest updates on Adapt Energy. Thanks, guys.